from these data points. Now, when it's argued that um, all theories are underdetermined by the data, by the facts, what sort of thing they're getting at here is this. One could have a theory which explains this data on the basis that there is a law of diminishing returns, that the further one goes in time, the lower the quantity is of whatever it is that you're measuring. And that theory is consistent with that data. You could have another theory that suggests, for example, uh, that if, um, if you have uh, an, an increase in quantity X, whatever this is, an increase in quantity X more than three times, you, it will be followed by a decrease in quantity X. That's another theory that's consistent with the data. Another theory that's consistent with the data is that if quantity X exceeds this level, then quantity X will decline. That theory is also consistent with the data. Now, and if we were to sit here for half an hour, with any data set, you could come up with any number of theories, all of which are consistent with the data. So the data itself is not sufficient to warrant the embrace of one theory over another. We need to draw upon other things other than, other than the data in order to explain the data. And as soon as we do that, we move into a realm where we're moving away from testing reality. We're moving away from use, using external objective measures in order to test our, th in order to test our theories. Um, <clears throat> to counter that, though, the uh, scientific realists point out that the problem they face in botany and in chemistry and so forth is usually not the existence of multiple theories, all of which explain the data. The problem is usually the non-existence of any theory that explains the data. Coming up with even one theory to explain the data is hard enough. And whilst my theoretical example here, you know, of multiple theories to explain the data set is so in a logical sense. When it comes to real, real data sets, you know, uh, it, it, it's much more, difficult, um, uh, much more difficult to make the claim. One would expect if there were multiple theories to explain any given data set, that chemists and botanists would constantly be at each other's throat about which theory is true and which theory is not. And whilst that's sometimes the case, it's not the general rule. It's generally the case that botanists agree that a certain theory either is truthful or has verisimilitude or is the best fit, is the best of the competing theories. So the... the under determination of all theories, whilst true in a logical sense, wouldn't seem to undermine the confidence of the scientific realists working uh, in their labs. A related um, phenomena is the fact that one can always gather more data. And in that way, theories are underdetermined by the data. So I've got a theory here that says if x, assuming that this axis is x, if x exceeds a certain amount, then whatever's being measured will decline. That's my, that's my theory. And my theory is supported by the data. As soon as x exceeded at this quantum, then we see a decline in the data. But let's suppose I go out and I collect more data. And what I see having collected these red data points, in addition to the green data points I had on earlier, what, what I see is now a different picture. And so the argument goes that there is always 
more data that can be collected, that the data that is yet to be collected may or may not support, may or may not be consistent with the data that has already been collected. Therefore, a truth claim cannot be made. A claim to, uh, of verisimilitude can, and a claim to the best, to be the best explanation, that can be made, give, given, because it's a more limited claim. But a claim that of truth uh, cannot, ac according, according to this argument. The historical record. If one considers the history of scientific theories in any particular discipline, what one typically finds is a turnover, a constant <coughs> turnover of older theories in favour of new ones as the discipline develops. <coughs> from the point of view of the present, therefore, from the point of view of 2012, most past theories can be considered false. Most scientific knowledge has turned out not to be scientific knowledge at all from the perspective of 2012. Why would we believe that from the perspective of 2020 or 2050 that the theories we hold in 2012 will be any different? Why will not the theories that we teach our students in our lectures today, why will they not be regarded as not truthful or not having verisimilitude or not being inference to the best explanation at some uh, future point in time. A good deal of historical work has been done by people like Lorden uh, who, who has um, uncovered uh, a whole heap of um, <clears throat> a whole heap of examples um, the, the crystalline spheres of medieval astronomy, the humoral theory of medicine, the efflu um, effluvial theory of static electricity, uh, catastrophist geology, theories of combustion, theories that rely on ether, theory that, theories that rely on empty space, uh, empty characterless space, uh, and, and so forth and so on. Th these theories have all been held to either be true or have the similitude or be the best explanation in the past, and none of them are regarded uh, as being so in the present. So, Lorden and others argue um, that empirically successful theories, theories that do fit the data like that, have shown time and time again not to map isomorphically onto the reality as we understand it uh, today. Uh, there is a response to that as well, but I'm not going. I'll, I'll leave the response to that to later, perhaps when we come up against when we come up against um, uh, Kuhn. Um, the pessimistic induction uh, thesis, you know, is uh, th this thesis that uh, where, where you, you've seen, we've discussed at length, the problems with induction. Um, the, the pessimistic induction thesis is, is an argument that uh, the task is the task working from induction, as science does, uh, is hopeless. Okay, so th there's. A couple of problems there uh, with claims to truthfulness that are made by scientific realists. How can a claim to truthfulness be made in the light of the underdetermination of all theories by data and in the light of the problems with induction, problems with gathering more data? How can claims to truthfulness be made in the light of the poor historical record of truthfulness in, in science. Th those are a couple of problems um, for the scientific realists. But is there anything, do we have any better thing to offer? Is there anything better to offer than scientific realism? Or is scientific realism truly the inference to the best explanation for the success of science? Um, there are 
there are some who claim to have a better explanation. The instrumentalists claim to have a better explanation for the success of science. And notice here they're not denying the empirical success of science. They are not denying that botanists do know a lot about trees. They're not denying that computer scientists know a good deal about semiconductors, logic circuits, uh, you know, electrical flows and, and circuit gates and so forth. They're not making that denial. But what they're denying is that computer scientists know the truth about semiconductors, that botanists know the truth of a tree. That, that is what's being denied. So how does it work then? What, what is the alternative? If you people here are able to do all these amazing things with computers, time after time after time you do these amazing things with computers and you're doing this without access to the truth, what on earth is going on? Are we back to this miracle thing? Now, are you all magicians, miracle workers? Well, no, the instrumentalists claim to have a better explanation than, than either of those. According to the instrumentalists, science works successfully to problem solve in a pragmatic way without going so far as to make a claim about truth. The instrumentalists claim that science can only provide a description of a part of the world, the observable part of the world. Now here I'm introducing a new idea, that the idea of observable parts of the world and unobservable parts of the world. The instrumentalists claim that we can't find out the truth value of theoretical statements that make claims about the unobservable world. We can only attribute truth value to observations, so they say, not to theories which have no observational uh, part, which, which, can't, which can't be observed. Now, what they mean by the observable world is just a common sense um, observable world. Animals, trees, crystals, you know, uh, th 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 those kinds of things. Um, what they mean by non-observable uh, entities or unobservable entities is things like atoms, electrons, quarks, leptons, neutrons, and, and so on. Now, a successful, according to the instrumentalist, and this is why it's called instrumentalism, a successful scientific theory or proposition is successful not because it's true, but because it works. And that's a profound, they claim that this is a profound difference, that you can make a claim to make the material world behave in a predictable way, you can make a claim that you have a grasp of the lawfulness of the material world, but you cannot make a claim to have the truthfulness of that world. Um, the, answer, the, the, the illustration, I think, is best made in the case of physics this difference between instrumentalism and truth, between what works and, and what is true, between what is observable and what is not observable, uh, comes clearest in the case of physics. Now, the scientific realists say that when physicists put forward theories about electrons and quarks, what they're doing is putting forward what they take to be a true description of the reality of the subatomic world, that a quark 